This program is brought to you by Emory University. This program is brought to you by the Emory University Center for Ethics. I went into neuroscience because I wanted to help people and I wanted to have an impact on society and I was really, the more deeply I got into my project, the fewer opportunities I felt I had to actually interact in a way that was meaningful for me with society. And that's not to say that I don't think people in the laboratory do meaningful work, but for me I, I felt that lack. So I kind of struggled with trying to figure out what directions to move into. And I started reading a lot of literature and I came upon something that was called neuroethics. And I was like, holy smokes, that's exactly what I want to be doing. And then I dug deeper and could, lo and behold, Paul Ruolpe is here, one of the founders of the field of neuroethics. And I just felt like that was a signal that I was on the right path. I struggled with um, defining neuroethics for a while, as many people do, I think, with ethics period. And um, even up until recently, there wasn't a universal neuroethics definition even available by the official International Neuroethics Society. But there is now, and there are two ways that you can define neuroethics. One is how neuroscience and neurotechnologies are informing our value systems. And, and two is the, um, the, the uh, neuroscience of ethics. So how doing brain imaging of someone doing some moral decision making uh, exercise. And I fit, my project now, my research now fits more into the um, former definition. I'm interested in how neuroscience informs our definitions of disease and also how we conceptualize treatment. And a lot of times people don't realize that technology often creates the balance of how we de define disease. So we used to not think of addiction as actually a medical problem or a mental illness. And, and more, more and more universally, people are understanding that this is not a moral failing, but this actually has a biological basis. That doesn't mean that people aren't culpable for their behaviors, it just helps us understand the disease process a little more and how we should treat those people. So now I focus on something called psychogenic movement disorders. And what it is, is kind of what it sounds like. It's psychogenic, so its genesis is thought to be from the psyche. So it has a psychological origin that manifests in a movement disorder that mimics other um, more understood disorders, such as Parkinson's disease or, or epilepsy, even paralysis. And they're uh, really debilitating. People can be wheelchair-bound for their entire life, and there's no treatment and not really a support system. And because we don't really understand the pathology behind the disease. It often leaves the patients in a different social reality for others. So they can't get a diagnosis, they can't get a consistent treatment. There's not even an advocacy group for these patients. And I was really surprised to see the different reactions to something that everyone called psychogenic. And I had never heard that term in you know, the decade that I've been studying movement disorders. And there was a really strong emotional response from people of all, all over the spectrum of, of emotions towards this. You know, some people were very concerned and sympathetic, some were a little frustrated, there were a lot of different responses. And I, I came to learn more about these patients and that there's actually a lot of them. So in epilepsy clinics, there's sometimes about a third of the patients, and in movement disorders, it can be um, 10 to 25%. So I thought it was important to find out first what are physicians doing right now for these patients and then develop hopefully a consensus where we can advise people on physicians on healthcare training, um, healthcare policy, and, um, and uh, all, all realms of this kind of, for all relevant stakeholders in this problem. We're looking at neuroscience and how it impacts our ideas about autonomy, identity, and free will, which will have major, major implications in um, legal settings, and also will have implications to healthcare, for healthcare policy. And there are also interesting questions being asked about um, 
how we should conceptualize and appreciate diversity. So there's a movement going on that I've mentioned before that is called neurodiversity, and it's the idea of, of how to appreciate and preserve um, the, the differences that we see. Um, and that, that, so for example, some people in the autism community actually claim that they, they don't want to be considered to have a disease. They want, to, they want that to be appreciated and that they're, the way that they communicate with the world is just as valuable as others, although albeit different. Um, there's also um, one thing that's really exciting about neuroethics too is that it's largely, there are some key female figures leading the field. So we actually have an opportunity to have a scholarly field led and pioneered by women, which is really powerful. So largely now, most of our ethics are informed by Abrahamic Judeo-Christian um, tradition, and East Asian philosophy, East Asian philosophical perspective is, perspectives as well as Buddhist perspectives would look at these problems a little differently. So I think that it's time to engage in that kind of scholarly work, especially as we embark on thinking about these problems globally. And um, another thing that's going to have a big impact is how neuroscience is defining our humanness or challenging boundaries of humanness. So now that we're identifying researchers here like Franz de Waal who have identified traits that have formerly been privileged to humans such as empathy in, in monkeys and also many people are identifying these traits in a number of animals, we start to wonder how human you need to be to be considered human. So even at Emory here in our, in our law department, in our law school, you can take classes on animal law. It's one of the most rapidly growing law fields. Um, and so you'll see that in the future we'll be reconsidering ideas of animal personhood. And that is going to be a, a debate that neuroethics has a huge part in. So lots, lots going on. <laughs>